government. In fact, it wasn't until sophomore winter, sophomore fall, that I got up the nerve to explore this course known as CS50, which at the time had this very daunting, very positive, but very daunting reputation, as did their say, computer science more generally, that was really a field to beware. And it was only because the professor at the time allowed me to take the course pass fail that I even got up the nerve to step foot into the classroom. And finally, at the last possible mi minute, I flipped that bit and changed to letter graded status, ultimately concentrating in computer science. And this theme, though, of exploring beyond one's comfort zone and trying something unfamiliar to oneself has really permeated for me personally the course over the past few years. Now, for those unfamiliar, you might know CS50 in one of its earlier forms. If you scroll back in time, you might know the course as ES110, an introduction to engineering, particularly focused on concentrators, which evolved over time into AM110, which evolved over time into CS150. <laughs> Meanwhile, perhaps more of you might recall Natsai 110, which was another predecessor of ours, which too over time evolved into something called AS, uh, AS10 and ultimately into QR20, and then along the way was a third branch forked off from these two lineages, one focused on concentrators, one focused on non-concentrators, first called Applied Sciences 11, then Computer Science 11, until in 1989 CS50 was born. And this is now the course that I myself now hold, and I thought what I would do in, over the next few minutes is just give you a taste of what's been going on in this particular classroom and why indeed it's been some exciting times on campus for computer science. So CS50 is an introduction, as we say, to the intellectual enterprises of computer science and the art of programming, which means it prepares undergrads today to be concentrators in computer science or in other STEM fields, but it's also meant to be an introduction more generally to non-concentrators. Indeed, a super majority of the students in the class these days are themselves non-concentrators, drawn from literally every concentration at Harvard. And in part, I think this is the result of the theme and the tone of the course that has changed, to become much more accessible and friendly, yet no less rigorous for students, in as much as we claim in the syllabus and as well in the first lecture, that what ultimately matters in 650 these days is not so much where you held a friend up relative to your classmates, but where you ended the semester and it's relative to yourself at the beginning of the semester. Indeed, we have multiple tracks throughout the course, inspired by Tom Kelly's own first nights, uh, sections for students less comfortable, more comfortable, and somewhere in between. We have problem sets for the majority of students in the class, and then a so-called hacker edition, targeted at 5 or 10% of the demographic that do have some prior programming experience, but have gaps in their knowledge, or are self-taught, and nonetheless want to exit the class on the same kind of playing field as others. And thus far, I thought I'd give you a few uh, highlights of enrollment numbers from at least the classes that are likely to be here today. Back in 89, when CS50 itself was named, we had about 150 students in the course. Ten years later, in my year in 1999, we had just shy of 300 students in the course. Fast forward to 2009, just over 300 students in the course. And most recently, we hit 700 students. So that is where we are today. Um, indeed, if we flip the camera around on you, this is what the first week at least of CS50 looks like these days here in Sanders, but even more striking perhaps are the visuals we see throughout campus. We've re uh, moved ourselves, as you may be pleased to hear, from the basement of the Science Center and its fluorescent lights and cubicles and all us out are now held in the house dining hall. So Ellie House, Lowell House, Lumber House, and several others over the past few years. So for instance, this is just a typical night at Leverett House these days, and this is a typical night at Quincy House. We regularly on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, from 8 p.m. onward, draw some 50 to 200 students per night at office hours for one-on-one -on -one help from their mentors, who are now a group of teaching fellows and course assistants that this most recent year have numbered a staff of 102 TFs and CAs in order to provide students with all the more hands-on support that we can. But what is computer science? What are any of those courses that you may have heard of but not necessarily took yourself? Well, I dare say it's more familiar to you and to our undergrads than you might think. In fact, the way we start week zero, as we say in the course, is to take this old thing, which frankly the undergrads decreasingly know what it is, but let's report uh, to know that it's a, a phone book, and inside of here are some thousands, names, and phone numbers, and I question how we might go about finding someone in this, someone named Mike Smith. Well, we could very correctly start at the beginning, and then flip the page, and then flip the page again, and flip the page again. Now, none of us in the room would do this, but surely we'll eventually find Mike Smith if he's indeed here, because this is a correct, if naive, algorithm. 
or procedure. And indeed, that's really the germ of computer science. Computational or methodical or algorithmic thinking, solving problems that may very well use a computer, but don't have to. Because indeed, most of us in this room would have better instincts, which would do what to find this Mike Smith? <laughs> Roughly, well, to go to the S's, sure, but if we don't know priori where the S's are, most of us are probably going roughly to the middle, give or take. And we might see, oh, M. So clearly N is just shy of Smith, which is an S. So what we can do, both metaphorically and physically, is... <laughs> Let's try this again. Tear the problem in half, thereby throwing half of the problem away. So if this phone book once had a thousand pages, now we're down to just 500. And we can do this again, going roughly to the middle, and I see, ooh, went a little too far. The T's are where I found myself. So I can again tear the problem in half, throw away that half of the problem, and it's again half in size. So we go from a thousand to 500, 250, 125, and so forth, until finally, hopefully, we find. <laughs> We find Mike Smith. Let's, let's go with it. Mike Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little rusty. So this algorithm is surely correct as well, but it's so much better. Because if we throw a graph in front of you, no numbers today, but a graph where the x-axis represents the size of the problem, how many pages are in the phone book, the y-axis represents the uh, amount of time it takes us to solve this problem, I claim that if I just go page to page to page, that's a straight line. We'll call it n, where n is the number of pages, because for each additional page, Verizon has, it's going to take me one more flip of the phone book. But I can do better. I could have done things in twos, two, four, six, eight, and I definitely would have gotten away faster. But the slope of that line might be better, but still not fundamentally changed. But a computer scientist might approach this problem, not unlike the humans in this room, and realize we can achieve this, the green line, which to get fancy is something logarithmic, which is only to say that if I took this phone book and doubled it next year by adding a whole bunch more people, and it's 2,000 pages instead of 1,000, well, no big deal. It's just going to take me one additional, or in my case, maybe two or three additional page tears to rip that phone book that's twice as big in half in order to whittle a 2,000-page a problem down to a 1,000-page problem. Indeed, if we, done, if we had some 10,000, or even, let's say, even bigger, a bit atrociously, 4 billion pages in this phone book, well, that would be a pretty massive phone book, but with just 32 page tears, could I find Mike Smith? Because you can divide 4 billion into only 32 times. So these ideas are actually not all that unfamiliar to students. And so what we ultimately try to introduce them in the course is to the familiarity of these ideas and the power, so that they can take even the simplest of ideas like this, turn it into programming code in whatever language we or they might be inclined to use, and ultimately solve problems, indeed, ever more effectively. In the last two minutes here, I thought I would share a glimpse now in the actual classroom to give you a sense of what the experience and, dare say, culture of CS50 and what it is now. Thank <laughs> you. 